I'm sitting here with Jason Cohen, and um, he was out to visit last week, and we kind of got this idea that we should reverse roles because he's out there telling everyone else's story. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are very curious about his story because he has an amazing story like everyone else that he's interviewing. Um, so it's kind of cool to flip the table around. And before we even start, I just want to say thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I know what it's like to lose some weight and then you get this brand new life and you just want to enjoy the life. And sometimes it's hard to look back. Um, because you're on to new things and you feel like, you know, you just got this new gift. But so I really appreciate the fact that you're going back and um, giving back to help other people come down the same path. I, I really, really genuinely appreciate that. And I know I'm not speaking for myself when I say that. So welcome to the interview, Jason. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm doing what I do because of people like you and, uh, and your stories and because I, uh, I truly believe that they deserve to be told and they need to be told. Awesome. So let's get started. Um, I know a little bit about you, but um, how much weight have you lost? What was your max and what are you down to now? So I lost, uh, at my highest, I was 297. Myself, like a lot of people, um, when I was bigger, I avoided the scale whenever possible. So the highest I know of was 297. I probably was higher at one point in time. And then I usually fluctuate now somewhere between the 172 and 174 range. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's Thank awesome. you. Thank you. So could you just go right ahead and just start telling what was your life, you know, at that weight? What was your life like physically and, and emotionally? Whenever I was my biggest, I, um, you know, I was just... To be honest, I was just extremely uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable with where I was at. I was uncomfortable in my clothes, in social situations. I felt like I just, not to say I didn't belong, but I felt a little out of place, especially as I got bigger and bigger. And I think I also had, you know, lived with the idea that I wasn't necessarily that big. I wasn't, you know, I don't think my mind had completely wrapped around the actual size that I was. And so I would make excuses for things, and um, but deep down inside, I was uncomfortable with where I was at. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't thrilled where I was at physically for my wife, for my physical activity, for just the type of sedentary life that I kind of basically relaxed into. And you know, before I before I decided to really kind of change things, I was just on I was on autopilot, and um, just through kind of a flurry of events kind of threw things in reverse, but up until that point, I was just, I was just coasting. So when you got to the point where you were coasting, um, was that something you dealt with like in your childhood? Were you always overweight or did, did that kind of build up? I think that, you know, as a early on in childhood and there's pictures of me, I was, I was a pretty skinny kid. And I think that really where the weight came on for me was probably towards the end of high school and then really into college and beyond. I remember when I graduated high school, I was a little bit bigger. I lived for a year away um, in between high school and college. And at the end of that year, I came home and I'd actually spent some time overseas and had like a parasite in my stomach. And I was the lowest that I'd ever been in my life, which was 220 at the time. And so from that point, you know, that's, uh, you know, I'm 19 at the time. From that point on, I just kind of steadily, as I, you know, started college, got married, started a business and kind of started a life focused on all those other things. I really just kind of slowly but surely put on the weight all the way, you know, through all of that. So you mentioned you have a business. What kind of business is it? I'm a photographer and uh, I was extremely fortunate in that I basically started uh, photography when I was in college when my needs for living were very low. So I was able to kind of do that full time from the time I was 19 or 20. And that's pretty much for the most part what I've done since full time. How, how do you think your weight at your heaviest affected what you did as a photographer? Did it really even matter? You know, I think probably physically, I had a lot of back issues when I was bigger. And actually, in some ways, I had some issues as I started to lose weight as well. And, and I think all that was probably just related to not paying attention to what was going on physically. And so, you know, most of my issues were related to 
you know, if I had a wedding or I had a commercial job that I was on for a really long time, you know, you're on your feet holding a camera, holding lights, and kind of just go, 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 and then in the car for, you know, two or three hours on the way there and back, all that stuff kind of just adds up after a while. And so, and also at the time, I was shooting a ton and I was also editing a ton. So I was sitting at a desk for a lot of it. So that added to my sedentary lifestyle as well, you know, just kind of in all areas, just nothing promoted any kind of exercise. And, you know, I would have, I would have times where I would, my back would kind of almost go out, so to speak. I'd go to a, a massage therapist um, who kind of, you know, would just work things out and then I would kind of limp out. But um, my back was probably the biggest cause of uh, of my limitations for work. I mean, I can remember going to jobs and just, you know, eating ibuprofen, you know, four plus at a time every, you know, it would say every four hours. So every, you know, three hours and 15 minutes, I would round up and and take four more ibuprofen just to kind of give me a little bit of relief. Right. What about traveling an airplane? Did it, did it affect that? You know, my biggest, I think I was probably just under the point at which I needed an extension, like a, like a seatbelt extension. I never needed one. Uh, I think like a lot of people, it was an uncomfortable experience just because, you know, you're being in a small place next to people who you don't know. And even if it is people that you do know, and you're kind of, you know, spilling over into the seat next to you, it's not a great feeling. And I think that although it wasn't, I didn't have it nearly as, as rough as some people because of where I was at size wise, it was still not a pleasant experience at all. Now, um, you're married. So what, at what point did you get married? Were you your happiest or were you still growing? Yeah, no, I was, I was very much still growing. We got married, we were 20. Um, so my guess is I was probably somewhere in the two thirty range, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. And I got married then and then just kind of steadily grew, you know, kept growing. I remember actually in, um, in marriage counseling, the guy who married us, you know, one of his things that he wanted to do with all the couples he married was to do something like seven or eight sessions. And we would, you know, each week talk about something different. And at some point there was something that, you know, it was a question presented to the, to the, to the point of, is there anything that concerns you about your spouse that you want to talk about now? And I remember my wife telling me, you know, in love, your weight concerns me about your health and about the future. And it's something I think you should, you know, I don't remember exactly what she said, but basically it's something that, you know, is on my mind. And I think it's something that, you know, like I want you to be around for a long time. And that conversation happened a couple other times during our marriage. Never was I receptive to it because I was overly sensitive to it and I didn't want to hear it. Um, but, you know, marriage counseling wasn't the last time that we had that conversation. Now, do you think that, like, was your wife's um, eating habits the same as yours? Were you guys eating the same food or what was different about your diets? Yeah, no, I mean, we ate basically the same foods. Um with probably a couple, you know, if she had class, we were both in college at the time, so if she had class, I may be eating a different lunch. For the most part, we ate pretty similarly. I think that I probably ate more than she did, and I also think that she probably maybe is just, you know, whether you want to call it genetics or whatever, just uh, deals with excess food a little bit better than I did. I also probably had a couple habits that she didn't have, like I was a uh, you know, I was a, I was a late night crammer. She worked at a coffee shop. So she was opening early in the morning. So I would, I would study for, for tasks late, or I would do my work late at night, which then would develop into me eating food late at night, which was a little different than her, but she certainly didn't gain, although she definitely is a lot slimmer and trimmer and fitter than, now than ever. She didn't gain weight nearly at the rate that, that I did. And I mean, we were eating, we were eating pretty terrible, you know, whether it was Chinese takeout or the bachelor special, as we like to call it with the mac and cheese and Totino's pizza, uh, you know, dinner for under two or three bucks kind of deal. Mm -hmm. What was like, um, like your activities, what did they look like? What, what did you guys do for entertainment? What did you do together? Well, initially we, you know, we were in college together. And so we, a lot of our time was taken up by school. Um, she's extremely studious and 
you know, so she took that extremely seriously. She also worked basically full time all through college. As I mentioned, I was starting my own business and worked as much as I was able to, uh, as much as I had business during college. And so most of our free time, you know, we spent a decent amount of time watching TV, um, but nothing that was really, I mean, we, we did like to travel. That was something that we kind of did throughout the entire time, whether I was bigger or not. And so we'd get out of town as much as possible, either just, you know, locally, regionally, or actually getting on a plane. But as far as physical activity, you know, in the way that I think about it now, there was no, there was no riding bikes. There was no running. There was no walking or jogging. Um, maybe, maybe taking a dog for the walk for a walk was probably the extent of our physical activity at the time. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but I know, um, you guys still go on vacations a lot together. Um, can you tell us the difference between your vacations now compared to what they were before? Yeah, probably our favorite thing to do now is to to do outside things. You know, before I think when we would do a vacation, it would be to go somewhere to see something. And once you see it, it's kind of like, you know, checked off the list, you, you do it. Whereas now, you know, our ideal location is to go to a state park or hopefully a national park and, and find, you know, several long hikes and go camping and bring the bikes with and go biking. And then if possible, bring the kayak with and go kayaking. And so most of our trips these days are focused in either areas or around activities that more promote, I guess you could say a healthy lifestyle and more are congruent with kind of where we're at now and what we see as, as, as things that we enjoy. And the other thing is it's really kind of opened up a part of our relationship, which is not the only part, but it's opened up a part of our relationship that we just simply didn't have for so many years that we never got to enjoy together. Right. Wow. I can definitely relate to that. Um, instead of going to places for efficiency, I would get a map out and actually look at the most efficient way I could get around the park to take as few steps as possible. So I can definitely relate to that. Yeah, I guess you could say that, that Jen and I, in the same way as y'all, are, are doing our, uh, our adventures now. And uh, it's, it's phenomenal. It is. It's unbelievable. Um, one thing I don't think we talked about yet is how, like, how long ago, when, when, at what point did you hit your heaviest? What year was it? How many years ago? I hit my heaviest probably somewhere around 2006 or 2007. It's a little foggy. Um, I probably could figure it out if I really sat down and text a few people uh, what years events happened. But I think 2000, somewhere between 2005 and 2007, somewhere in there, I remember I actually, I think I got a, a bicycle as a gift and that happened at the beginning of the year. And I think I actually started, uh, what I ended up doing was a weight loss challenge slash bet with a friend. And I think that started in March of that year. So that was kind of, you know, timing wise. Yeah. I was actually going to ask you about the bike, but before I do that, um, did you have like a, a rock bottom moment or, or even a collection of moments that like this, this has got to stop. Something's got to change. For me, it kind of was a perfect storm of sorts. I had a friend of mine who I was close with who was a little bit older than me but looked way better than me who passed away kind of suddenly of a heart attack. I also had a couple friends who were a little bit older than me who I saw were dealing with some of the issues that come with being bigger or not taking care of your health. And I really kind of just projected my current situation forward and said, you know, things don't look good in the direction I'm going. And it's kind of simultaneously, I got on the bathroom scale, which I never did before. And at the time we had one of those, those scales that, you know, it's got a needle and it, it creeps up as you step on. And when I, when I stepped on it, I thought that, you know, the needle was going to go all the way over. It only went to 300 pounds. And sure enough, it stopped at 297. And it was just, you know, to see my weight in front of me was kind of shocking, I guess you could say, because I, I really didn't know where I was at. I think I was in a 44 or 46 pant at the time, which was also, you know, I felt uncomfortable in that and then I kept having to buy larger clothes and I kept having to punch holes in my belt, not in the direction that I really wanted to. And, you know, that, that 297, when I saw it, I basically just said to myself, you can't get above 300 pounds. Awesome. 
Okay, so I kind of already know the answer to this, but I usually um, you ask, you know, what was that, you know, where the change came from, what was the inspiration to change, but I kind of already know the answer to this, so I'm really curious, I've never heard, heard the entire story about this bicycle. You know, I had a friend who uh, is still one of my best friends to this day, and he actually had worked with me, he was my second shooter at weddings, and he was, he'd worked with me for probably... I don't know, a couple of years and he was moving to Austin and as he was moving to Austin, this was around the time that I was my biggest and he basically said to me, Hey, I want to buy you a gift as a going away present. And so I was kind of, you know, surprised number one. And then I was really surprised when he told me that going away present was going to be a bike. And, you know, my initial thought was what's a 300 pound guy doing on a bicycle and I hadn't ridden a bike since I was a kid. You know, I thought to myself, I'm going to die. Like I, like, and on top of all that, people don't ride bikes here. We don't have bike lanes. Um, you know, motorists aren't used to uh, dealing with cyclists in traffic. And so it was, it was the last thing on my mind. And since then, you know, I think the biking culture here has gotten better. We do have a couple bike lanes, but at the time, there was nothing. And so he got me a bike. Um, I remember it was uh, Chrome. It's the loudest thing you've ever seen. And he refused to let me set it up with a freewheel, so it was fixed gear, so it was even scarier. And I'm happy to say that actually now that bicycle resides at Jamie's house. Oh. And yeah, so you know, I, I started on this bike and, and what initially I remember the first ride I did on it, I was probably going three miles an hour. I really thought I was gonna die. And <laughs> You know, in, in the next couple of months, I ended up falling in love. I ended up buying another bicycle, which at the time I thought, you know, my wife thought was the most expensive thing known to man, which now I know actually wasn't terrible. And I just kind of, I, I found a new love in, in getting around the city, seeing things in a new light, you know, doing what I do for a living. I'm extremely visual. So I had a chance to experience you know, the city where I live, Lafayette, and also other cities that I would go to in a way that I just never would have experienced them out of the window of a car. And, you know, within a couple of months, I'm, I find myself fully suited up in spandex that's hugging me in places that I don't want to be hugged. And, uh, and, you know, that's just, that was kind of the progression. And, you know, still to this day, if I don't have too much going on where I have to, you know, get back in a hurry, my bike is still the way that I choose to get around. So he, you know, he gave me a gift beyond what was in front of me. Right. And he probably had never had a clue where that was going to go. That's so cool. Yeah. And the funny thing is he's extremely competitive as well. And, uh, you know, we went from being, he, you know, he's a, he's an extremely talented BMX guy. He also runs. And now it goes back and forth between he and I, in terms of, uh, you know, challenging each other, Let's go on a run. We'll see who's faster. We'll see who, who can keep up, you know. Uh, and so it's, it's funny how that relationship, although it's, it's still, it's as strong as ever, the dynamic of it has changed in ways that I would have never expected. Can you just take us back a little bit from that first ride? Like what, what made you get, I mean, obviously that first ride probably was not the most comfortable thing in the world for you. What made you get back on the bike the second and the third and the fourth time? You know, I, I think around that time I decided, you know, all simultaneously, like I mentioned, I decided to make a change. And so for me, my realization was I'm willing to try anything for a short period of time. Any step in a positive direction is a good step. And so I really kind of just started to adopt an attitude of I'll try anything. And if I don't like it, and then, and then really, you know, as I started doing it more and more, I kind of got addicted. And then I had a I had an office at the time um, that was probably five or six miles away from home, and I thought to myself, what if I could ride my bike to work instead of instead of taking a car? And then that would be a way to just integrate my exercise, quote unquote exercise, into my daily life without actually making time to go and do something else. And so it kind of just became this opportunity on several levels to to try some new things. Awesome. So basically you started moving your body more than you used to. Um, did any food choices or food decisions, did, did they change as well? You know, initially I was willing to try anything. 
I think I mentioned doing the weight loss challenge. So I challenged a friend for a weight, a six month weight loss challenge. And at the time, you know, before I, at, at 297, I wasn't eating anything other than, as I said, beige things, whether it was, you know, I would, I would go to Thanksgiving dinner and I would have turkey, a roll, pie, and then probably more turkey. And that was my Thanksgiving dinner. And that's what, you know, although they were maybe different items, that's what most of my meals look like. And so really any, any, any change, any move in any direction was kind of a positive direction for me. So I started experimenting. I would do, you know, maybe like a meal replacement shake, or I would do, um, you know, random bars, or I tried to, you know, just kind of expand. I was really picky. I didn't eat any vegetables. You know, my idea of a vegetable was basically a French fry and iceberg lettuce with Thousand Island dressing. And so I said, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try spinach, you know, maybe I'll try apples and bananas. You know, I think fruit for me, and I think probably for a lot of people are kind of an easy segue into starting to change things because there's still a little bit of sweetness and I had a huge sweet tooth as well. So were you doing any research or you were just, you just knew that fruits and vegetables would probably be a better thing to eat than beige food, like you call it? Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't really do any research until really far into it, to be honest with you. And I was just, I mean, I guess you could say I was doing research and then I was trying to kind of drum up conversations with people I would come into contact with and I would try and, you know, ask for advice, people who I knew maybe had a little bit to give. So I did research in that way, but as far as really diving into any kind of science or um, studies or anything like that, that didn't come until much, much later. So at the end of the six month challenge, um, what, how much weight did you lose during the six months? And did you win? Did you win the challenge? I can say that I won. Um, by the time I started the challenge, I'd already lost 10. So I was down to 287. And then when I finished up the challenge, I lost another 40. So by the time I lost the challenge, uh, sorry, by the time I finished the challenge, I was about 50 pounds down from my starting. And, um, yeah. And the funny thing was, was that the, the, the prize for winning this fantastic thing was actually dinner for four at like this really nice restaurant in New Orleans. And I think, I think I had a, I don't remember exactly what I had, but it was, it was nothing that would have helped me win the challenge in the day to day. Okay. So typically after a six month challenge or a diet of any sorts, uh, when you come down off the six months and you go out for that, you know, victory dinner and eat stuff you shouldn't, um, typically, the weight creeps back on and you at least get back where you started or for some people, for a lot of people, you get a little interest with it. What happened after the six months that kept you in it or did it? Yeah, no, I think the big thing with the six months was six months was long enough to show me what was possible. And the other thing was, was that I thought to myself, you've made all these decisions, all these small decisions, you've put in all these small amounts of exercise all of that will not go for nothing. Um, I just simply wasn't willing to put in all the work and not like I could, I couldn't have lived with the idea of going and shopping for 44 size pants again, because of the fact that I knew that the amount of time and the amount of effort and the amount of mental energy that it took to get to where I currently was. And so basically I just said onward, you know, I just said, what, um, what is, what can I do next? And the beautiful thing about about the six months was it really was me proving to myself something other than the lie that I've been living in, which the lie previously was, there's nothing you can do about this. You're always going to be big. These are the cards you were dealt. You know, you just, you do the best with what you got. And this is just, this is just the way things are. And six months, those six months specifically showed me that that was a lie, that it, that it was, you know, it wasn't, there was no truth in that, although I had been living under that assumption for so long. Wow, that's that's all awesome stuff. Um, so I know you, because you've sent them to me, um, you make some crazy kale chips and you have some really like super delicious breakfast bars. How did that all work into your diet plan or your, your new lifestyle? I think a big part uh, that a big part of the equation that I realized and that my wife really supported me on was that, you know, you can't just go into it haphazardly that you have to have a plan, whether that's a plan for today 
or for this week or for six months or for a year. And so I basically, you know, just said, if, if I have the option, I'm going to reach for a Snickers bar or I'm going to reach for cookies or I'm going to reach for, you know, all these other things. So what I need to do is to replace those options. And so one of the big things that my wife would always do is she'd always cut up an apple for me every day. I knew that, you know, she's a teacher and then I was a photographer. I kind of kept night hours. She got up early in the morning, but I knew that when I woke up and I went to the fridge, there was going to be apple there for me cut up. And yeah, and so, and then, and then kind of the kale chips and the date rolls and the breakfast bars and muesli and all that other stuff came from, we would kind of spend Sundays just doing prep for the week. And so whatever we could do for the week that would kind of keep me set up for success, so to speak, in terms of eating, we would do on Sunday. And so we'd spend an hour or two or three, depending on what needed to be made, we'd peel carrots, we'd cut carrots, we would um, make breakfast bars make almond milk, just anything and everything we could do to make sure that I had the healthy choices closest to me when I was going to make an eating decision, we would do ahead of time. And, and really the, you know, the kale chips, for example, those are a total labor of love. Cause if I told you the amount of time that she spends when she makes those, it's unbelievable. And I think a big thing, uh, you know, a big part of it was she was committed with me. Okay. So I'm going to go off on a little tangent here because I think this is super important um, because there's a lot of similarities here with, with our wives. Um, my wife, well, you know this because you just spent a week with us. Um, she, she has been a huge part of my change, but at the same time, we lived a long time together where I was 400 and your wife lived with you when you were at your heaviest as well. So for anybody out there that's listening and, and maybe has a spouse that's, it's, you know, they're having trouble with weight or whatever. Um, I'm kind of setting this up because I already know the answer, but what could your wife have said to you 10 years ago or 11 years ago that would have changed your mind? Could, is there anything that she could have said that you would have woke up one day and said, you know what, it's time to go? I think you already know this, but the answer is probably no. Um, I think for me, timing had a huge part to deal with it. I was also super fortunate in that, you know, unlike yourself and many others, I really didn't deal with a ton of medical issues. So I didn't have, I didn't have a monkey on my, the weight was the monkey on my back. I didn't have a monkey on my back as far as medical issues or other things that affected me in a way that such that I, uh, you know, was able to just kind of put it off. The only thing that affected me really was the weight and without seeing, you know, friends around me unfortunately pass away and then unfortunately get sick, I don't know that I would have been open to it because she had tried before. She had, you know, in very gentle, loving ways mentioned to me that she was concerned about me. And and you know this better than anybody else, but when you're when you're big, especially at your biggest, and you're not feeling great about yourself, it's only it only makes sense that you're gonna be sensitive about it. You spend so much of your day thinking about what everybody else is thinking and trying to deflect that and trying to, you know, just kind of get through the day to day of it, that when somebody tells you something, it sometimes can feel judgmental, even if it's coming from a place of love. And I think that, you know, no matter what she would have said, with me being in my circumstances, I don't know that I would have been accepting of the information. Right. Sometimes for me, I look back at that and that's kind of hard to deal with that that I put her through that, and at the same time, I mean, she must have felt helpless because I think in her heart she knows that there's nothing she could have done to get me to change my mind as well. So if we could flip that whole thing around, because I think this is another important thing that people struggle with, um, is there anything that your wife could say or do now to make you revert back to your heaviest? No. I've worked, I've worked too hard for it. And I, I don't mean to say that in a, in a cocky way, but people like I'll have friends who will joke, uh, who will joke. I think, I think you maybe even Jamie mentioned this to you, you know, that like he had said something at some point or somebody had said something at some point, like, aren't you, you know, are you ever worried that Jason's going to get back to where he was before? And the reality is for me, and I, and I say this when people, I talk to people about it is imagine something that you've worked your hardest for like one of your most cherished possessions whether that's a car or that's a wife or a kid or a house 
or a boat, you know, whatever that might be, if you've worked so hard for that and then imagine somebody, imagine somebody just coming in and saying, nope, I think I'm going to take that from you. Like you'd be, you'd be furious. And for me, it would be the same situation. I'm not, I'm not willing to give it up. You know, I'm, I'm determined. It's, it's a, I'm in a different place now where it is in a lot of ways, one of the most important things in my life and something that I've put center and priority. And there's nothing that I can imagine giving it up for. Okay. So I heard you mention or read somewhere that, um, you, you were into a little bit of competitive biking, cycling, and, uh, you did the spandex in the Jersey and, uh, you used to ride with a group. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So as I got, you know, further and further into biking, you know, it's something that I, I am, a, as you notice, after spending a little time with me, I'm a very outgoing person. I don't oftentimes do well with being by myself. So the idea of getting on a bike for two or three hours by myself, you know, basically sounds like the most boring thing in the world. And so I started seeking out groups and didn't realize that people actually do this on Saturday mornings or after work. And so, you know, surely and steadily, I just started, you know, connecting with people that were uh, doing longer rides, started, you know, that kind of just started down a path and um, ended up, you know, making great friends. And it's not something I do nearly as much anymore. I think, you know, for me, my efforts are focused in a little different way, both with this project and then just personally where I'm kind of at with my physical goals. But it was a it was a great opportunity, a great experience, and something I still enjoy doing. I'm going on a group ride tomorrow with a bunch of people. The only difference is tomorrow's group ride is going to be instead of a bunch of people in spandex trying to hold 22 miles an hour um, into the wind, tomorrow's ride is going to be with a couple friends who are a little bit newer to cycling, and hopefully I can kind of pass along some of that passion and some of those experiences I've had to them to hopefully uh, ignite that fire. Which is exactly my next question. Um, do you do you find it more enjoyable now that you're not trying to be out there seeing how fast you can go or who you can keep up with? Because you'd mentioned that you would rather ride with other people that are, and get them interested into it. And maybe a part of that is to try to give back what your friend gave you at the bike. Can you just explain it a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I think the group rides were great for me. You know, you kind of you kind of work your way up. The first time you go out, you're the slowest person. You get faster and you get faster and faster. And you know, cycling is great because it's very easy to see your progression, especially amongst your peers. And it, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I think that, like any things, it can be taken to a different level and a and a, and a level of seriousness that's, that's almost a little bit self defeating. And probably in some ways I got there, you know, you, you get into these aspects of riding that I don't, aren't necessarily where I want to be or aren't necessarily my goals. And so I think, I think it is more enjoyable now because for, for me now cycling isn't just about me. It's also about realizing, you know, and, and, and sometimes that just means that it's a ride with my wife and I don't have to go super fast and I don't have to, you know, spend, uh, you know, I can bring a bike that's maybe a little bit heavier and not worry about it, but I'd rather spend, you know, an hour on the bike with my wife going at a much lower speed than I would three hours on the bike with a bunch of sweaty old guys in spandex. And, and then, and then, yeah, you know, I haven't figured out what, what my role is in this whole equation for spreading the message as far as cycling specifically, but I know it's something that definitely is at the top of my mind and I'm passionate about and that I hope that if nothing else, like you said, I can just kind of be a small part of, of passing along some of that inspiration and some of that, uh, you know, what the, what the bike did for me to somebody else. That's awesome. Um, so I heard rumors that, um, you actually just did the Leadville half and it was kind of like a surprise thing. It wasn't planned. You just kind of showed up, the race was there and you did it. And I wondered, um, if, 14 years ago, if someone said you're going to run one of the toughest half marathons, what would you have said to them? I would have said, what's a half marathon? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was it was so far beyond my radar. I mean, 
you know, I probably was, I think we've had this conversation, but I, I was probably similar to you in that it was like, why are those people doing that? Why is that, why is that important to anybody? And, you know, as you mentioned, Leadville was kind of a total surprise for me, but it was a total, even without really realizing it, it was kind of a bucket list item. Um, and it was a bucket list item that I never knew that I had and I never thought I would have. And then, of course, now, as you know, uh, you know, the next step is, well, I got to go back and do the ha and do the full next year. So, you know, it's a, so much of my life is in a place where I never expected that it's just one more thing, whether it's, you know, the simple things like cooking, like cooking, like I never cooked before, or, um, you know, I mean, when I was, when I was coming down, when you, when you, when you come to the finish in Leadville, you kind of come down a street, which was actually really nice because you spend a lot of the day going up. And uh, I remember I came around a corner and I saw in the distance a few people. And then as I got closer, I saw more people and I saw the line. And then, and then you, you, know, you see street, people, finish line and kind of all the, the everything going on. And then you look above that and you see what I'm guessing is probably a couple 14ers in the distance, mountains. And I kind of like had a little bit of a breakdown moment, which I'm usually not super emotional as I'm running and just realized, you know, everything kind of come together with me, came together to me very quickly in that, you know, where I had come from and where I was. And it was really a surreal moment and you can see it. Thankfully there was a photographer there that captured it. And, you know, I just have an ear to ear grin because truly what I thought, you know, where I was, I would have thought would have been impossible previously. That's awesome. And you stole my next question because I was going to ask you to finish. You probably know that I'm very emotional. Um, so I was going to ask you how the, how the finish felt. So thanks for answering. Yeah, no, it felt amazing. I mean, it, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a high, like I've never felt before. And, and, and what a backdrop to have there too, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, whoever is putting on that race is doing it right because it, uh, actually it's my, it was my first and only race. So I say that I don't really have any experience with other races, but I mean, it was, it was an incredible, it was an incredible experience. And, you know, the, the entire time everybody's sitting there, you know, you're, you're going up and they're coming down and, and they're cheering you on telling you great job and you're going down and other people are coming up and then you're telling them, you know, great job, keep up the good work. So it's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal experience. That's awesome. And congratulations. That's awesome. So you don't just decide two days, three days before uh lead bill that you're just going to run it. So could you just walk us through what your your training obviously you're running um could you just walk us through like an average week of what your training looks like so what happened with the leadville thing was I, we were already in colorado and i had been running and uh so i was i was a little bit prepared for that for the altitude um probably pre better prepared than some people you know we had been in colorado at the time for a week or a week and a half we were kind of just traveling seeing friends um but in, in general, you know, I, I typically run anywhere from two to four days a week, depending on the week. And those are usually somewhere between uh, four, five to seven mile runs. I'm kind of, you know, I've got, I've got the Leadville full in my, in my site for next year. And so I'm trying to get those miles up. And I usually try and work in a day or two of exercises, uh, of, sorry, like weight exercises or resistance exercises. Even if that simply is just uh, doing push-ups and squats. Right before we got on, I owed myself some push-ups. So I did some push-ups right before we started. And I've been doing a little bit of yoga, which originally I thought was the goofiest thing. And I would have never done. My first class was a not-so-great experience. And it's something I've kind of just begun to enjoy because I don't, like I said before, I don't do well being by myself with myself. And so yoga has kind of taught me to work on that a little bit. I also, I think... You know, one of the the things about cycling and running that sometimes people, especially myself, maybe don't give the time to to focus on is the strength aspect, especially in the upper body uh, areas. As you saw, as I was trying to get the bench uh, the bench press down at your house, and so I'm trying to you know I'm trying to work on that a little bit, and then and then yeah, I try and commute as much as possible on the bike around town. You know, yesterday I had some errands to run two different times during the day. It took me 30 minutes to get somewhere. It took me 30 minutes to get home. I did that twice. And so I got two hours of riding in in the same amount of time, in the same amount of, you know, 
effort as far as you know what I had going on in the day than I would in my car. But instead of just driving there and driving back, I actually got a bunch of you know exercise and whatnot in. And you saved a lot of gas too. So this is good. true. This is true. Okay, so super quick, um, can you just run us through like if what what does a day of food look like for you right now? So right now, typically I'm eating uh, fruit with steel cut oats in the morning, just like uh, raw fruit, raw steel cut oats with a little bit of cinnamon. Lunch kind of varies just day to day. Usually we try and cook at night for uh, to be able to have leftovers, especially like I mentioned, my wife's a teacher. And so it's always just really helpful for us, for her to have something that she can eat uh, at school without a microwave or with minimal effort. And so we do a lot of Asian food. So that might look like a soba noodle bowl with a kale ginger salad or a broccoli cauliflower stir fry. We actually do sushi a lot, which actually makes pretty good leftovers with just veggies and fruit. And then, you know, baked potatoes from time to time. I definitely do some salads. Asian food kind of tends to run our life these days. And then dinner just kind of, it just depends. Uh, you know, it, it, again, a lot of times it's the Asian dish. We do, a lot of, we do a lot of roasted potatoes and beets. So we'll do roasted potatoes and beets like over kind of a hummus uh, you know, bed or with rice, or we'll just throw a bunch of veggies in a, in the skillet and do that. Right now I've got baked potatoes in the oven. I'm going to put some, uh, probably some salsa and some broccoli with that, maybe some carrots, and that'll pretty much be dinner. For the most part, they're usually pretty simple, but yet extremely tasty foods. Cause I, I really enjoy the flavor of foods now, much so in a way that I didn't enjoy it before. So my thing is how can I work in some really delicious flavors and also experiment some, but have those be health promoting. Right. That all sounds like super, super good. Yeah. You didn't even let me cook for you while I was there. I know. You're going to have to, you're going to have to come down to Louisiana and then I'll make everything for you. I will do that after Leadville. Um, okay. So if, if you could go back and tell your former self something, what would you say? If I could go back, I probably would tell myself that it's possible. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe what other people have other people have said, maybe not necessarily directly to me, but you know, what people just kind of say in general. And I think it probably would have been hard to receive, especially because looking at people around me, I, you know, I didn't find myself in a I wasn't alone in the situation. It wasn't like I was, you know, poor old me. A lot of people deal with and struggle with a lot of the same things that I was dealing with. But I think the main thing is, is just not to believe what, what you've told yourself, the lies you've chosen to believe and the lies that, that surround you. Right. So kind of as you think you are type thing. Yeah. I think there's that, there's that quote. I think maybe actually Anthony was the one who brought it up, but, but you know, whether, whether you think you, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Right, right. That's an awesome quote. Um, so this is kind of along the same lines, but if you could give someone a message out there that's sitting where you were when you were at your heaviest, what would you tell them? I think one thing would be, you know, maybe be, I know for, for me it was true, be gentle with yourself, take your time, you know, know that it, it probably took you a, a fair amount of time to get to the situation you are now. And don't expect that you're going to be able to work your way out of it in an instant or a month or a week. You know, take the long game. It's going to be worth it. It is worth it. I've talked to plenty of people who say the exact same thing. And even if you think that, even if you think that something seems insurmountable, you know, it's, it isn't. And I remember, you know, I, I had a conversation with a friend of, a friend of both of ours earlier today, Justin Lacey, and I was just talking to him about, you know, he started at 500 pounds and he's already lost 200 and he's now where I first started. And if I would have, if I, you know, I, I feel like in some ways, especially after meeting these people, I had it easy compared to some people, but even somebody like him, who's, you know, formerly over 500 pounds, if that guy's able to do it, if you, Tim Coffin are able to do it, if Josh Lajani, you know, Jared Monosmith, Anthony Masiello, all these other people I've had the privilege of talking to, if they can do it, they're no different than you. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about any of them. 
the only thing that's different, and I think somebody said this, was, uh, was basically the start day. Wow. That's pretty deep stuff. Very cool. So normally this is where I'd thank you for doing an interview, and uh, we would end it, but actually we're going to get a little bit further because I have other questions for you that I'm dying to know. Um, All right, let's do it. That was a great interview, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Um, I actually learned a lot that I didn't know. So, Okay, so I want to talk to you now as the Jason Cohen um, that is very fit and trim right now, and it is putting out this project called Big Change of Film. Um, it's it's kind of, it's I, I feel like it's been evolving really fast and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger but i just like i see what's going on from the outside and i would love to kind of get inside your head and see um well first of all what what is the whole idea behind if you could sum the whole idea of what you see happening with big change why are you doing this first of all the why and the goal are probably two different things if that makes sense the why i'm doing is because I just think that there's a there's a lack of I guess they're kind of one and the same, but I see I see a lack of inspiration out there for people who are at those really big weights, who are in a place where they feel like they're kind of trapped in their own body and their own maybe self made prison, and I think there's a huge space for 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 giving some inspiration to others and and maybe seeing it in a way that we're not used to seeing, you know, not seeing it in a way that's glamorized and that you know, is like some, maybe some of the TV shows that they have to create drama and are short term, really entertainment solutions rather than real solutions for people in their life. And so my goal with this, you know, is basically to make a full length documentary following four people and to go to hear their stories, to basically get a glimpse into their life, what makes them tick, what their journey is what they've done to make them successful and, and weave those stories together into a full length documentary that somebody, whether, you know, regardless of the area they want to make a change of in their life, but specifically with weight loss, you know, targeted towards those people. And unfortunately there's a huge market of those people out there that need to hear this message. And for me, my hope is, is that through the full length documentary that it'll provide, you know, kind of a space to talk about some of the stuff in a long form and in a way that's, you know, thought out much better than I could ever put in words in something like this and, and really kind of pierce people's hearts. And hopefully that those four people that I follow yourself included would be diverse enough group that no matter who sits down and watches that they can kind of connect. And then I don't know if this is also relates, but basically after we started, what was basically just a couple days with Josh that developed into, you know, basically me getting interest and people reaching out to me and saying, Hey, I've got a story as well. And just realizing that there are a ton of people out here doing this and that their stories need to be heard. And also I wasn't going to be able to travel to see somebody else in another, you know, two days or two weeks or maybe even two months. So how can I keep this content and this information going out to people? And that's kind of where I got the idea for doing the Skype interviews, for doing the podcast. And, you know, it, it really just started, if you'd have asked me at the beginning when I kind of pitched the idea of this, I actually, before pitching the idea of this to Jamie, I actually told another friend who is really good at keeping people accountable that I wanted to do something like this before I told a single soul. And I never imagined that I would be sitting here talking with you or spending a week with you, or talking with Justin Lacey, or any of these other people, you know, I had no idea where this was going, but I knew that a big part of it was just starting the process, and putting one foot in front of the other, and having the faith that, like, this was gonna, this was gonna go somewhere, and that people were gonna respond to it. Similar to your weight loss journey, right? This is very true. So, you just stole about four of my questions, so, um, so, from what I understand, just to reiterate, this started as a documentary and then kind of turned into uh, a lot of these podcasts, which I find like, I actually look forward to them. Like I can't wait till they come out. I'm serious. Um, so it's really cool. It's really cool. And it keeps interest going in it. Um, but I guess you kind of, kind of hit this a little bit, but at first, when you first started doing this and you kind of put the feelers out there to get, you know, a hold of people that had big change in their lives, 
Um, are you surprised how many people are out there? I don't know if I'm surprised at the number. I'm a little surprised at the amount of people who are willing to let me ask them uh, very personal questions uh, and answer them to a total stranger. Um, which probably more so in the beginning because I was, you know, I was nobody. I was, I wasn't a, I, I didn't have any episodes or uh, videos for people to watch initially. And really, all I had was that piece that I put out about Josh. And then previous to that, I pitched the idea to Josh because you know after I decided and pitched the idea of doing this with Jamie, the guy who I'm, you know, is doing all the all the filming for the film. The only person that I, you know, Josh had nothing to go off of. It was just a, a stranger with a camera and an email address. And, you know, now it, 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 at least I have something I can point to to tell people, like, this is what I'm working on. So I think it makes it a little easier. But I think what really just surprised me is, is people's willingness and openness and the amount of people that pre-interview I say, hey, is there anything you don't want to talk about? And they just say, you know, my life's an open book. And... I think that there's a certain vulnerability that I experience with some of these people that is, you know, highly helpful to me and hopefully to other people that I just didn't, I didn't have a way of anticipating. Why do you think people do that? I don't know, but please don't stop. Uh, you know, I think that, I think that one person inspires and encourages another. And when you hear somebody like, you know, uh, Adam said, you know, talk very realistically about addiction and what that entire process is like. And, you know, you hear all these different people who are kind of bearing their soul, then it makes you realize that maybe, maybe I could do that. And maybe my story could reach somebody. And, you know, you also kind of realize that, which I realized in the process, like I had it pretty easy compared to some of these people, you know, and I think everybody kind of brings a little bit different take to it. It's always interesting to hear some of the same pe some uh, different people answer the same questions because the answer is sometimes so different and and so there's so much insight that without getting inside their head I would just plain lack otherwise. Wow, so that was actually my next question, but I think and maybe maybe um, people want to share their stories back and just leave their life an open book because they realize what's on the other side of that door. You, you know, I think, I think for me, it's like, it's almost like you open the door, you look through it. And once you get there, you're like opening the door back up and say, come on, you got to check this out. It's awesome over here. And I think you tend to, you, you, it's so good on the other side that it's okay to be vulnerable. If it means someone else coming through the door. If that makes sense. Yeah, and I think in some ways it almost seems like, hey, I'm having a party over here. Like I'm having a great time, and I know what it's like when you're not at the party and you're not having a good time, and you want to, like you said, you want to bring people along. You want to say, like, hey, come on over. Like, like, like things are things are good over here. Wow, that's awesome. Um, okay, so if you could take all the interviews, podcasts, everything you've done, and you can kind of already know the answer to this one too, but you could boil it all down and, and set up this perfect scenario for somebody that's trapped in a prison that they created and maybe trapped in a body that they shouldn't be in. Um, and, and you've talked to so many people, you've interviewed so many people, there's got to be this magic formula that you can just can and give away to people. Have you found anything like that? Yeah, we're working on a product right now. It's patent pending. No, um, you know, hopefully, honestly, hopefully the inspiration that, that I'm able to kind of just highlight from these people and step out of the way and let them step into it, hopefully hopefully that'll be a little bit a part of the, of the, the quote-unquote solution. Because, you know, whenever you, when you've been told something your entire life or society tells you something, you know, I was having a conversation uh, doing an interview with somebody and they said, you know, you know, you're basically looking for, you're looking for the Loch Ness monster. You're looking for Nessie, like you're looking for the outliers. But I think unfortunately the reason that they're outliers is because we've been fed a narrative that simply isn't true. And so if I could say that there's something that, you know, distilled down, 
it, into something that'll that'll change things, or maybe not a product, but maybe a, maybe a slogan. But I mean, the reason we pick big change is because it's that, and it's real, and it's possible. And I've seen it with all these people that I thought I would, you know, that I thought it wasn't it wasn't possible for me, much less for people who come from way, way, way harder circumstances than me. And, you know, change is possible. Awesome. Okay, last question. If you could get your, like, ultimate plan out for this film, what would it look like and where would it end up? Just walk us through what needs to happen uh, for the best case scenario for your dream to come true for a big change of film. Well, I don't love uh, talking about or asking for money, but you know, in the in the short term, what would kind of make things be a possibility uh, faster will be if we're able to get any kind of partners or sponsorships or donations um, to actually do it. So far, everything I have funded myself, which is great, and if that's what it takes, I'll do it the whole way through. But you know, next steps as far as just for getting things done is is that we're probably going to look at um, we're going to look at finding two more subjects, whether through interviews and I kind of have in my head a bunch of criteria for those next two people, and really those reasons are mostly because I want to make sure to re- be able to reach the most amount of people, and I don't want to have four people who look, talk, and walk the exact same way to fill in those other two spots, you know, so to speak. And although I don't think that anything is an accident, you know, in a way I chose Josh very, or I, I say I chose Josh. I made the decision to reach out to Josh for very specific reasons because I saw things in him that, that, you know, number one, I just saw a story that was unbelievably compelling, but I also saw things in him that the everyday person could relate to. And in the same way with you, there were there are things in your life in different ways that people can relate to, even in ways that Josh could not relate to them. And so for the next two people, I really want to have people who can relate to others in a way that neither you nor Josh can relate to them. And um, you know, one thing that's important to me is geographically diverse. I really would love to have somebody who's possibly from a different part of the country or just comes up in a different culture and you know, there's some other things that in my head I would love to have in a perfect world. The other thing is I want to just make sure that I have people who I can kind of, you know, aren't going to be weirded out by the fact that I'll be at their house or doing things for, you know, three or four days. And so, you know, all those things kind of factor in. And then from there, you know, really my hope and my goal would be that, you know, right now it's August, uh, I don't know the date, August 8th, August 9th, somewhere in there, 2016. I would love by the summer of 2017 to be finished with filming and I would love to be able to have something uh, fully produced by the end of next year. I would love for it to be my ultimate goal, just like, you know, I had that initial thought from sitting on the bike watching Netflix. My ultimate goal would be to be on Netflix and to be just because I think that's the biggest platform. It has the ability to reach the most amount of people. And so that's, you know, if it, when I, when I think about, when I dream about where I want this to be, that's where I want it to be. Wow. That's so cool. It's awesome. Well, I know you're not an emotional guy, but I said I am. And seriously, like this, when you first contacted me, it was cool. And, uh, we got to connect and you even spent a week here. But, uh, aside from that, it's really cool because not only, you know, do I get to experience the film part, but, um, we've actually become friends through this. And I think that's pretty cool. A perfect strangers and, and we're friends now. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you're doing and, uh, your potatoes are going to burn soon. That's all good. It's all good. It's not an Insta pot. It doesn't cook it like that. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm using, I'm using caveman technology over here, comparatively speaking with an oven. <laughs> But, well, thank you for the interview. It was great. It was fun to flip the tables, and I think we did good. Yeah, Tim, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for mentioning this, and um, thanks for everything you're doing. And, you know, I know that uh, it was an honor to get to see you and your family up close and what you guys do and the way you live your life. And I know that you're doing things and you're helping people, and I I always look forward to, to sharing your story with others. 
and can't wait to do that in a, in a little bit different way as well. Nice. And you're not an axe murderer, so that's good too. This is true. There was rumors. You can't believe everything you read on the internet. All right, Jason. All right, take care. Have a good night. Bye-bye.